you very, very much for uh, inviting me back again um, to uh, listen to what I've got to say about supporting people in developing countries. You are some of my most loyal supporters. You invite me back every year and I really appreciate your support. Uh, especially because this time you're not going to get quite what you think you're getting. <laughs> I know that what you're expecting to hear about is the trips that I've been on since I spoke to you last year, and you will get some of that. In the last year I've been to two places, Cambodia and Nepal. Both of those projects I've visited before, so I've made return visits to the educa education-based projects in those countries, and I was also looking for potential new projects uh, that might be uh, suitable for people with business skills or with health skills. And that was a similar brief in both countries. Uh, however, I don't want to just talk to you about what I've done on those two trips, because also during the last year, I've done a lot more work in this country trying to raise awareness of some of the issues around volunteering in and supporting people in developing countries. I've been going into schools, I've been working with a couple of churches, and I've been talking to groups such as yourselves, and I want to share some of that with you too. As I think you know, the organisation that I volunteer with is People and Places, which is an award-winning, ethical and responsible volunteer travel organisation. People and Places was started in 2005 by Sally, Kate and Harold. What happened was this. Sally was a very, very successful businesswoman. I think you will have heard of her business. She ran Long Tall Sally, the clothing company for mm -hmm. tall women. Mm -hmm. She decided to, that after 25 years in the fashion industry, she would sell her business and she wanted them to go volunteering. So she did her research, she looked around for a project that would suit her business skills. She found a project that looked ideal in the Gambia. She paid her money to the organisation that was organising this project and when she got there, there was no project. Mm -hmm. Basically, just a scam. She found things to do while she was there and totally by chance she met Harold and Kate and Harold at that stage was Professor of Responsible Tourism at Leeds Metropolitan University, so they had a lot in common and a lot to talk about. They got talking about the fact that Sally's experience was by no means unique, that many organisations that send volunteers or people to help on different projects are to a greater or lesser extent just there to get people's money. They're a business like any other. And they talked about how exploitative this is, both for people like Sally, who go to volunteer, pay their money, and find that they're not expected when they get there, but also for the countries where they go to, who suddenly find someone arriving, maybe for six months, uh, who doesn't necessarily have skills or experience that they need, who's going to be around wanting them to find things for them to do, and who they have to host. Right? So it's exploitative all round. They talked about what should they do about it. And first of all, they thought, well, they would campaign to make sure everybody knew about these exploitative practices, a naming and shaming campaign. And then they thought, actually, there's not a lot of future in that. That would only have a short-term impact. What they could do, and were in a position to be able to do, was to start a volunteering organisation that actually did this properly. So People and Places has always had two sides to its work, campaigning to highlight good and ba bad practice in the volunteering industry, and then a volunteering organisation that sends volunteers uh, on really specifically skills-matched projects to various projects around the world with 10 different countries we have projects in, um, and each individual's placement outline is written specifically for them to match their skills and experience. In other words, we are aiming to put the right people with the right skills in the right places at the right time to do a specific job that's right for both sides, a win-win situation all round. Mm -hmm. Now up to this year, I've not done anything to do with the campaigning side. As you know, I've just been involved in the volunteering side 
And part of my role is to go out to these different countries and help them work out exactly what are these needs that they would like volunteers to come and fulfil. We can't do the skills matching if we don't know what the needs are. So that's what I've been doing, but I've realised that in the nine years since I've been volunteering, I have learned so much um, about not only volunteering, but all aspects of working in the developing world. And on the basis that if I've learned a lot of things and I don't really share them, that's not terribly responsible for me. I, I'm wanting to share this with you and with other groups like yourselves. Not only volunteering. I've realised that what I've learned affects how I behave in any interaction that I have with people in the developing world. As a volunteer, certainly, also as a tourist, I quite often do holidays in the developing world before or after my volunteer travel. When I'm deciding who and whether to donate money to, and as I'm helping others to fundraise, I think in the last year I've done all four of those things, um, helping people who are going on their gap years with coffee mornings and boot sales and that kind of idea, donating both to disasters and on a regular basis, and certainly volunteering and as a tourist. Um, I also think that when I normally talk to you, you're very interested, but really it's just Diane's holiday slides. <laughs> you're not actually going to go volunteering yourselves or certainly not through people and places, some of you do it through other organisations. Uh, but if we start to include those other categories, I think that, that that may well involve more of you personally. So what I'm hoping to do today is give you some things to think about. You don't have to agree with me on everything I say today, I'm pretty sure you won't all agree with me on everything, but as long as I've given you some things to think about and made you aware of some issues, I've done what I've set out to do. So, what kind of projects receive support? Well, given that I've just told you that every piece, people and places volunteer yeah. has an individually written placement outline, and that it includes people on holidays and on their gap year, and people donating money, clearly there is a huge amount that I could talk about. But on the basis that we'd all like to get home at some stage today, I've tried to group this into four main categories which all attract a lot of support in one way or another. Some of them more appropriate for one category than another, but all of them um, appropriate to at least one of those categories that I've just outlined and that involve lots of people uh, giving support either as a volunteer or as a donor um, to try to improve life for people in the developing world. So I'm going to start with building and practical projects and I would like to say that, don't worry, not all my pictures are just writing. Uh, there are plenty of pictures for you to look at but at the beginning of each of those four sections I've put up uh, one um, key, key questions really for us to think about um, which say the main things that are problems in doing this type of supporting people and then highlight the ways in which we can do this well. Because I would like to stress, and I'll say this again at the end, I would like to stress we do not want people to stop supporting people in the developing world just to stop doing it badly and inappropriately. So lots of people go on building projects. Um, it's a key element of many gap year experiences to go and help build a medical centre or a school or a block of toilets or something like that. It's increasingly becoming a part of quite a lot of holiday tours, a couple of days building something. Um, many volunteering companies offer building projects as well, as something that people can, can go and do. And people feel that this is a really helpful thing to go and do. The key question really is what is being built? Is it genuinely needed or are well-meaning foreigners imposing their ideas? And foreigners means us. It means foreigners to those countries where we're working. I'll give you two examples of projects that were done with the best of intentions that actually were not very successful. Quite a lot of years ago now, when I was in Thailand, some people told me about people who had spent a lot of money in the aftermath of the tsunami. A very large bread-making company 
had tried very hard to think of something that would provide alternative employment, particularly for the women whose husbands have been fishermen, so that they'd lost their livelihood as well as their homes and their families in the tsunami. They built lots of little local bakeries, and they thought this would provide alternative employment for those ladies. It didn't work for one very simple reason. Nobody asked anybody locally about this, and nobody gave a single thought to the fact that in Thailand it is a rice-based diet and they don't eat bread. <laughs> Second example. Pat's done quite a lot of work with people from the Solomon Islands. She told me that when she was in the Solomon Islands, they showed her lots of toilets that had been built about eight years ago by people who had gone there, absolutely horrified to find that in the Solomon Islands they don't have toilets, as we would think of toilets. They use the ocean, they use the forests, they go off somewhere on their own and bury their own waste. The idea for them of people all using the same spot to go to the toilet is totally filthy. Those toilets are being used, they sleep in them. Now, now what a waste of money on both of those examples. The key thing is who is in charge. Is this something that local people have said they would want? Because if so, it can be a very good project. But if it's something we're imposing on them, we're wasting money, we're also feeling that we've done something really good and useful, and we've actually been really patronising mm. by actually doing that. Also, I think we should think about why our foreign volunteers building it. No mm. youngsters going off on gap years are trained builders. Mm. So why on earth do we think that it's appropriate for them to go and build? Mm -hmm. A teacher told me very recently about um, uh, a project that's happening uh, that she's taking a group on and they're going to continue building a medical centre in Ecuador. I asked her, do you think local people are in charge of this project? And she said, yes, I know they are because I've been there on a preview visit, visit and we can see the bits that volunteers have built because for health and safety, the volunteers are only allowed to go up to a certain height. So the bottom bit that volunteers have built, the walls are all kind of wonky, and the top belt built by local people is built really nice and straight. Well, it does kind of make the point. But they're still very useful projects because it says, how can foreign contributions best be used? What we bring if we're going on a building project is money. And if we didn't bring the money, those buildings would not be built because there'd be no money to buy the materials and no money to pay local labourers. It's a very useful thing to do, but I think we should be aware that what's needed is our money. Now, a key time to help out on building projects is after a disaster. When there's a disaster, such as the earthquake that happened in Nepal in 2015, everybody wants to flock in and help. Many people go and want to help rebuild people's houses absolutely immediately. I took these photographs in a suburb of Kathmandu called Kokona. There are still many piles of rubble lying around in the streets. And they told me that people who came in there were in the way. They were just other people who needed looking after when they were totally traumatised themselves. And because buildings are built in a different style, they're... Um, a uh, custom in Nepal is to build floors and ceilings out of concrete. You can see here quite uh, large blocks sticking out from the buildings. When people just rushed in and tried to pull things down, quite a lot of concrete ceilings came down and quite a lot of people were killed. They've changed their earthquake advice to people in the country not to shelter in the house but to run outside in the event of a new earthquake. But really, people coming in with the best of intentions to help out were in the way. I also went up into the mountains when I was back in Nepal in the spring, and luckily nobody could get here to help out because it was totally inaccessible other than by helicopter. Right? The villages here were completely cut off. I last went to this village in 2012, and it looks pretty different now. A lot of the houses are still down, so there's still lots of pile of rubble, and there are lots of tin shacks, which are temporary accommodation that people have put up. Some houses look okay, such as this one here, but when you get a bit closer, you can see that actually it's not. There are cracks in the walls, big hole in the wall over there, falling down here. Um, so that house is going to come right down. The people who own that house, though, also have a house in Kathmandu. 
And if you see this lovely balcony here with the carving on, one thing they're doing is taking back to Kathmandu bits of their house like that to repair so that they can then bring it back again and put the house back up again. But that will take time to actually uh, do that. Um, I put in that house deliberately because that's where I stayed when there, I was there in 2012. This is the room where I slept. <laughs> Makes you think really, doesn't it? That one I think won't be rebuilt. Again, the people who uh, lived there um, have a house in Kathmandu and they're in Kathmandu now. And the person I spoke to said that one will probably just go. Now what they actually want is not us rushing in going, oh no, we must help you rebuild your house. They want to take advice, and they have taken advice, on things like how to build walls to make them more earthquake proof. They've learned about foundations. They've learned that when you build a wall it's a good idea to put in these uprights going across because it's likely in an earthquake that a bit of the wall will fall down rather than the whole thing. But they want time to be able to do it in their traditional style. Like I said, they were recarving that balcony. One good thing that's come out of the earthquake is a real rejuvenation of traditional skills. The wood carving has become a really popular thing for young men to start doing, and before it was just something your granddad did. So like these pillars have got the traditional carving in them. This is in um, Durba Square in Patan, which is part of Kathmandu, which is a World Heritage Site. No way do they want that to be re rebuilt quickly. They want to do that carefully. There are historically very important buildings there. What they told me was, if you're going to help us, help us rebuild big public buildings. We can't afford to do that, but leave us alone to do our houses when we're ready. So that's a newly opened monastery, it's a Buddhist area, so the monasteries are very important to them. But most people are living in the tin shacks, such as this one, and actually they're quite happy with it. The top two pictures there are the um, um, tin shacks, which are the home of one of the teachers at the school, and I must say it's really quite nice. I didn't go into the house, um, you may be able to see his baby daughter in the doorway there, I think she must have been born there, um, she's, too, she's much younger than two, um, and that's the only home she's going to have known. They've got a water tank outside, they've got a planted up garden, they've got a little lawned area, tree trunks to use as seats in the garden, I mean they made me a coffee after school and it was really pleasant sitting in their garden there. Um, and they want to rebuild their house, but when they're ready, when they've saved up, they're going to rebuild, they actually want to rebuild a nice house and not rush it. And the lady who showed me this house was an older lady, and she said they can rebuild my house if they want to, but I'm never going back into it, <laughs> uh, because when my brick house came down, it was terrifying. And if I'm here in this house, it's not going to kill me if it falls down. Her house is no further away than I am from you. Uh, she, it's been made safe. She can go in, she can get her stuff. But they've got the fire here and the bed. And most people in this part of Nepal live in one room around the fire anyway. Um, and that's what she's recreated there. And she plans to stay there always. What was really useful though, after the earthquake in Nepal, was where money could be donated to specific projects, not through the big um, disaster relief charities, because it's hard for money like that to always get to where it's needed. Some of you gave me some money when the uh, earthquake happened, knowing that I had contacts up here in this area. I don't know whether your money was used to rebuild this school, but I do know that the charity it went to has rebuilt 100 plus schools in mountain villages in the mountains. So I read you a thank you letter from them when it first arrived, but thank you again from the people in that area. This photo was taken a few days after the earthquake. You can see the rubble there as the school came down. But the foundations were still there and I took this photo in March. So it's back up again. It's not complete. Uh, this building's done this end, but not that end. This will be the computer room and it's not ready yet, but this classroom's certainly ready and lessons are going ahead. This classroom is a science lab. It's fairly basic compared to science labs in this country, but they're doing science experiments. And that teacher there in the beautiful grey pinstripe, pinstripe suit is the man who lives in the tin house that I've just shown you. 
What about when it's not a disaster? The same principles apply. Let local people decide what needs doing and let them stay in charge. This was a school group going out to help with a building project, building a library and playgrounds at a school in South Africa. You can see the two South African men in that picture and they're definitely in charge there. This picture was taken in Peru and they're building uh, covered gardens to try to encourage people to grow a bigger variety of fruit and vegetables to improve their diet. This is being run by the local man who's at the top of the ladder there. They use volunteer contributions, some physical contributions, some financial contributions to help, but he's very much in charge. Let local people be in charge. The trouble is, of course, unless it's a disaster, money isn't forthcoming, unless there's an experience as well. We're not going to just donate money to a building project unless there is something in it for us going out there. So what works really well are collaborative projects. In Cambodia, their houses are all up on stilts like this because of the rainy season, so that nothing floods. Why we don't use that style in this country on the floodplains, I've no idea. Uh, the walls are made out of palm branches, which you cut off the trees, soak, and then let dry in the sun, and then weave together to form a wall. And I've been in some places where they've told me that when it's the rainy season, they move away from that flooded area and they may well take the walls of their houses with them and just leave the frame behind because they're very light and portable. There seem to be several houses looking like this, just half built with the framework. And I asked about this and they said, no, this is part of a volunteer project. They've paid the money to actually come and they'll be coming later in the year. So we've used their money that they've paid so far to employ local people to build the framework and then when they come, we shall teach them to make the walls. And we'll make the walls together and put them up together. And that seems to me to be a good, a good project. People working together, but local people very much in charge. Similarly, and I'm kind of pushing building project here a little bit, because it's all kind of practical type projects. In Peru, they have a very good scheme for planting sustainable forests to stop them just cutting down the rainforest on illegal logging measures. They planting up areas with three different types of wood that can be harvested at three different times. Planting the seedlings is really hard work. I know I've done it. I'm a very hard work indeed. Uh, but volunteers do this two days a week. They told me that local ladies are queuing up to get work to plant the forests and they pay them to do it. So I queried why volunteers were doing this two days a week, if it could provide employment for local people, and they're much, much faster. They said five times faster. Mm -hmm. And the answer was, as I should have guessed, if there weren't volunteers coming and paying the money, there'd be no money to buy the seedlings and no money to pay the ladies. So they've gone for a um, three days for the ladies, two days for the volunteers compromise. Mm -hmm. And again, that seems to me to work quite well. And sometimes building can be a really small one-to-one -one little project. This is something that one of our volunteers took part in. One of the community centres we support in Cambodia has a motto, opportunity, not dependency. Now, people come there to ask for help, but they have to pay back in some way, but they have no money. They are basic subsistence farmers living on less than a dollar a day in that area. The lady who's our manager of the community centre thought that one good thing that they could come and help with was, was the garden. If they grow food in the garden, they can use it for the dinners, for the people who are there. They can sell any surplus pro produce, but they didn't really have a very good garden. The picture on the left there I took when I was there last autumn. Since then, we've sent a volunteer with a specific brief to work with the lady who manages that place to help her build raised beds, to show her how to propagate seeds, and then she has got local people working there, and that picture came back quite recently. So building project on a small scale. So my key things about building projects are let local people decide and be in charge of it, then we can do a really useful job. But don't go out thinking we're saving the world by building them a toilet. Business projects will be my next category. Business projects are mainly one-to-one -one volunteers going out. 
less of that happens. We do quite a lot of it at People and Places, sending people on a to work with a specific business person uh, to improve their capacity to make a living. It does seem to me that if we think too many economic migrants are arriving in this country, and a lot of people do think that, we know that most of those economic migrants would stay at home if they could make a living there, and it does seem to me that if people with business skills could go and work with people one-to-one -one and enable them to earn a living in their own country, that that would be such a worthwhile thing to do. So these projects can work really well. Um, again, are we fulfilling a need that they've identified? Are we replacing local labour? Is a really important point, though. Quite often people say to me something like, could you send us someone to write a website for my business? We would try not to do that for several reasons. One, there may well be a local person who could be employed to write them a website. Uh, and if so, we shouldn't be doing it. Also, um, websites get out of date very quickly, don't they? And they crash. Mm. And if we've written it and then pushed off mm. back to the UK, then it will just become obsolete very, very quickly. So we would say, no, we won't go and write your website, but we will come and we will teach somebody here to write a website and work with them because then they've got that skill and they can carry that on with them. And many businesses in the developing world don't last very long. They're there and then they close down and people move on to something else. And if you've given people a skill like how to write a website or use social media as an advertising tool, they'll carry that on with them onto their next project as well. Uh, which makes it all much more sustainable. I have no experience of business, as you know, but Sally clearly does. She has told me that to run a good business, you have to get five things right. You have to have the right product in the right place, at the right time, in the right quantity, at the right price. Often, they've got four of those things right, but one not quite right. And we've spent quite a, a bit of time with volunteers going out there, working with people on one aspect of that. And this is the sort of thing that people with business skills can do really well. This lady went out to the Gambia to work with several people there on the design of the garments that they were selling. They have beautiful fabric in the Gambia, mostly batik dyed. Um, they wear garments like this, which we would not wear, would we? Uh, but fabric's fantastic. If they want us to use it for anything more than, say, a tablecloth or a bedspread, they need to adapt their design a bit. They want to sell to tourists, so this was helping to get the product right for the tourist market. This volunteer worked with this lady and the local designers, and they used the material to make things like these dresses that she's modelling there which went up for sale in some hotel shops. She also helped them design some of the sort of dressing gowns uh, that you might find on the, um, in the bathroom in hotels, and a couple of big hotels took orders for those. Um, so that's the sort of thing where you can help to get the product right. These are in Cambodia. I liked this project because these ladies had in the past been living on the streets and they were trying to find them an alternative way of making a living than prostitution, which is what a lot of them have been forced to do before. Now, they've done quite a lot of market research, that, um, and they're doing this weaving. They're weaving, uh, by the way, with plastic bags. Now, so it costs them nothing in uh, materials. They collect the plastic and they bring it in to work with them. They try and bring a sack full every day. They crochet them and they make all sorts of innovative things with them. So it's a litter clearance scheme, and it's making things that they can sell. They've done some research around the hotels, and they got an order from a hotel for 30 of these baskets, and the hotel was going to use them in the bedrooms as laundry baskets. But it was quite a good hotel. They want 30 that look the same. And this is where they had to do a lot of work on quality control. They were trying to show me it's really hard to get the height the same and that black stripe in the same place uh, if you're actually just crocheting with old plastic bags. Um, and the concept of getting 30 the same was an unusual concept for them to work that out. But somebody had been to help them with this and was there with a ruler helping them measure it mm -hmm. and everything. And they're going to produce a quality product there. 
They make a lot of these kind of things, which are for sale on the market in Siem Reap and sell to tourists for not very much. Uh, we might buy one of those little mats one, if we were on holiday there to bring home as a holiday souvenir. But if somebody works with them, or maybe the colours and the style, it might be something that people are more likely to buy if they could do just a little bit of tweaking of the product. It doesn't have to be just things to sell on the local tourist market. This is a place in Nepal where they were looking to really the far end of sales. It was actually a really excellent coffee shop. And everything they've got in the coffee shop is either made from recycled materials, well it is all made from recycled materials with the aim of as much as possible of it being linked with coffee. So the lampshades that you can see in that picture top left, made out of paper such as we used to have in the 60s, are made out of filter papers. Uh -huh. Coffee filter papers, really pretty, because although they've washed them off, it retains the coffee colour. Mm -hmm. That's really pretty things. Um, these cushions are made out of coffee sacks. Um, this table has an old window shutter in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And this seating, the uh, metal bits for the legs, are made out of bits of old bicycles. Uh -huh. What they were talking about was what happens if the tourist market dries up? Um, it's very vibrant in Cambodia at the moment, but you can't rely on tourism lasting forever. And they're talking about we should be able to sell our stuff around the world nowadays. We don't have to have tourists coming here. So, for example, this here is like a drip tray for coffee. You pour your coffee in the top and it drips through into the mug through a hole. Uh, um, and they were talking about, well, we should be able to adapt that design to make it flat pack for export. Um, so getting the product right can go from little woven mats made out of old plastic bags to designing something for export, but it's all the basic principle of getting the product right. Right place. I'm taken on my trips to loads of places like this, big weaving sheds. Um, most women uh, seem to be able to weave really beautiful things um, and make beautiful garments out of them. They had a nice little shop attached to their weaving shed. There were some clothes and scarves around the back and the baskets here. It was fairly priced. But it took me 40 minutes in a tuk-tuk on a rainy afternoon to get there. Mm -hmm. I asked how many people come to your shop here and I was the sixth visitor that week and it was Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, they're in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. um, they probably need to move into Siem Reap where there are many tourists 40 minutes away. But then they will have to get there. Well, they have to have somewhere there to store their stock or bring it backwards and forwards. And they'll need to look at their pricing. Because if they do that, they'll need to put their prices up. Right? And that's quite a difficult concept because they think that's the price and they'll end up making a loss. But someone with financial skills could certainly go and help them with that. Helping to get the supply chain right. These, this is a chain of uh, little cafes and restaurants. That was in a village, but there's some quite high-end restaurants in the middle of Kathmandu. They've set this up as a women's development project. Uh, and they go from the market gardens where they grow the produce to cooking traditional Nepali recipes in the kitchen to the young girls doing front of hats in the restaurants there. Um, they have some orders from local supermarkets, uh, but if you're going to sell to the supermarkets, you've got to have a consistent supply. You can't just say... <coughs> Sorry, can I have a drop of water? You can't just say, oh, we've run out of that today, we didn't grow any. I took this photo in the Gambia a while ago now. <coughs> this lady makes beautiful sauces and chutneys. She has done advertising. She has got leaflets in hotels. She does have people arriving, but she can only make that much at a time. She wanted to go global, that was her ambition, but she's got a stove about the same size as my stove in my kitchen. And if she wants to go global, she's going to have to have a bit of help. Um, so really, work needs doing there on the supply chain, quantities, getting the right stuff at the right time, but so much potential there. We're good at market research in this country. It's quite a different concept in some countries. Quite a lot of volunteers we've sent help in one way or another 
with market research, with advertising. That volunteer uh, helped set up a radio station to advertise local businesses and running training workshops similarly. My third category is medical and health projects. Um, at People and Places we don't do a lot of sending people to do, well we don't do any, sending people to vaccinate people, that kind of idea. There are specialist medical charities that do that kind of thing. Uh, but we do have quite a lot of community health projects and if we're talking wider than just volunteering but also donating and supporting um, charities, quite a lot of people do donate to medical charities, um, either by donating money or by giving stuff. Right? For example, it's quite common to see people appealing for old hearing aids or old pairs of glasses. Uh, I saw a group of opticians in Peru and I wasn't sure that what they were doing was really very useful or very sustainable. They come from a country in Europe, they were testing everybody's eyes, they've never had an optician there to test people's eyes ever before, because it was quite remote in the, on the edge of the Amazonian rainforest, they discovered that lots of people have really poor eyesight and they gave them free glasses. But I did ask what happens if they lose their glasses or break them, and essentially the answer was, well, we'll be coming back in three or four years. And I thought, as someone who's very short-sighted and couldn't manage without my glasses, I thought, would I prefer never to have had them than to have been given them and then lose them. But we do think that projects like donating old pairs of glasses are really useful as long as there's a constant supply. So I think we need to take responsibility for that. If we see somebody asking for that, yeah, donate our glasses, but try to find out, do you send them regularly? Not just think, oh, I feel really great now, I've given my old pairs of specs to a charity. I'm taking it through like that. And then what are the priority healthcare issues in this community? We mustn't be patronising and go in and assume we know what level of knowledge they already have. Uh, somebody said to me in Cambodia, your level of medical knowledge is up here. Theirs is down here, in this country where we live. Theirs is down here. If you come and expect to get them up there, you'll fail. Mm -hmm. But if you expect to get them to there and you actually get them to there, you've done a really good job. And I thought that was very helpful with thinking about what could be done with these kind of projects. Running community workshops is a real key one. These are water filters. They've just been fitted to houses in this village. They were running community workshops to explain to people the importance of drinking clean water and things like washing your hand off, hands after you use the toilet. That's the kind of thing where they would love people to come and help them produce materials to give out, but we have to remember that half the people there will not be literate. So a lot of leaflets will have to be produced in picture form, and it's really important to find out what their level of knowledge is, because how totally patronising it will be of us to go and tell them to wash their hands after using the toilet if they already know. But if they don't know what a big impact that could have on their health. Sometimes there's opportunities for sharing specialist skills. I took these photos on Tomalsap Lake, which is a massive inland lake in the middle of Cambodia. It's the second largest inland lake in Southeast Asia. People live in isolated communities in the middle of the lake on these stilt houses. I've seen them also in Burma, where I went on holiday after I'd been to Cambodia, where I, what I thought was most amazing was how all these reeds that grow on the lake, they had kind of woven together and held in place with big bamboo poles. They had dredged soil from the bottom of the lake, which is very fertile, put it on the top of the reed mats they created and planted salad vegetables on them. Mm. I have never seen so many tomatoes growing in one place and it was all in the middle of a lake. Mm. Uh, uh, they were uh, growing 80% of the salad production for the entire country. Um, so they can support themselves there, but they certainly don't have access to medical care living in those areas. I met a man in Cambodia who is called the Lake Doctor and he runs three boats which go out around the lake. Uh, once a week they go to each place so you know the medical boat will be coming on a Tuesday 
And on each boat, they have a couple of nurses, local nurses, they don't need nursing help, a doctor, a dentist, and a midwife. If there's an emergency, they can get people back to Siem Reap in the boat, but mostly they do community health care, and the dentist checks people's teeth, and they've got basic medicines and things. And we have put that up on our website, because that would be quite an intrepid volunteering adventure. You'd have to camp out for the two nights you were out there. Um, but if you have medical skills, I think that would be a great opportunity to be able to do that. Different kinds of specialist skills. This lady is a counsellor. No? She's out there working with some people from one of the very poor townships in Port Elizabeth in South Africa. There's a real high incidence of AIDS in that community and extreme poverty. Uh, she's obviously not counselling their clients, that would not be a responsible thing to do at all. She's counselling the people who are the counsellors, who go out there. She's giving them new techniques and she's providing some counselling for them because they also live in that community. Um, and you know, we all know that if you're involved in something like counselling, you often can benefit from actually having it yourselves. Similarly here, this is a school for uh, disabled children in Kenya. About 70% uh, of them are deaf, and they would love teachers of the deaf to go there. But we also found what, they, what works really well is drama teachers. Because so much learning, if you're deaf, is through mime. And I saw a lady there who is a very good, very dramatic in the way in which she teaches. I don't think she's a drama teacher, but very dramatic. And it worked really well uh, there in that kind of environment. These children suffer from multiple disabilities. Um, quite a lot of very disabled children in Kenya, largely due to very poor uh, care when the mums were pregnant. Um, or giving birth without any help at all and lack of oxygen in the birth process. And the trouble with Kenya is that's a shaming thing to happen to you if you give birth to a disabled child. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, many of them are in this residential school and what they want is therapists. Physiotherapists, uh, occupational therapists, speech therapists, and they have some. But therapists that I know spend a lot of time sharing therapies with each other, swapping ideas. They would love any therapist to go and help them with that. But I'm sure you'll agree, you can only do this kind of stuff if you have already got those specialist skills. When I was in Nepal, they took me to one place, which was again a school for very disabled children. There were two girls there on their gap year through another British volunteering organisation. They cannot possibly have been trained for physiotherapists because I would not put their age at over 17. Um, there was a girl, a very disabled girl, lying on a treatment bed. There was a local adult in the room just standing at the side. And there were these two girls on their gap years, kind of up on the bed, trying to do physical exercises with this disabled girl. I thought that that was a safeguarding issue all round. I thought it was completely intimidating for the 17-year-olds to be faced with that on their gap year and probably quite dangerous for the girl they were manipulating. Um, and so this really does have to be done with specialist skills matched to specific needs and working with a local person. And my final category is working with children. I've left this one till last because I think it's the most important. It's the most important for a number of reasons. One is it's the biggest. All four of those categories that I talked about, donating, tourism, gap years mm. and volunteering, have many, many ways of going and working with children. And because it's the biggest, it can lead to some really successful ways of helping, but it's also the one with the most potential for exploitation. Many, many people think that what they'll do on their volunteering trip or on their gap year is they'll go to a school and teach English to people. Why does everyone think they can teach? <laughs> huh? They all go and assume they can do that. And everyone I have ever asked, how would you start if you were going to teach English to children who don't know English? They always say, I'd start with the alphabet. <laughs> well, yeah, so did last week's volunteer, and the week before that, yeah. and the week yeah. before that. They can all chant the alphabet. They probably don't know what it is they're chanting, yeah. but they can all do that with no problem at all. 
Uh, um, yeah, I, if you're going to go in and you're going out helping the classroom, you have to make sure that you're helping children, mm -hmm. and that is simply hindering them by going in and actually doing that. An increasing number of holiday tours in these kind of countries includes a visit to a school. Would we want a group of tourists coming into our classrooms? And not just once, at least on a weekly basis, probably more often than that, I, trooping in and helping. I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago and a lady said to me at the end that she'd been on a tour somewhere in a country in the Far East and they'd been to visit a school but she thought it was okay because they'd only interrupted lessons for a short period of time and they'd actually done something really good because they'd been told by their guide that the school was very, very short of notebooks and pencils. So first they'd gone to the market, they bought the notebooks and pencils and she thought that donating them to the school had done more good than the short interruption that they've made to the lessons. That is a scam. Almost certainly that is a scam. As soon as that tour group left, those pencils and notebooks will have gone back on the market again, ready for the next gullible volunteer, almost certainly. That will be a three-way split between someone on the market someone, a guide, a tour guide, and someone at the school who's allowing for that. It may not be, I may be being too harsh, but, and I've done it myself when I started travelling in these kinds of countries, but I'm pretty sure that there will have been an element of that. So yeah. as far as those children are concerned, they've had their education interrupted, they've gained nothing, and they've actually learnt that uh, tourists are there to be exploited, yeah. and begging off rich foreigners is okay. So none of that's really very, very helpful. And then, you know, in terms of donating money, just think about the advertisements used by the big charities. Think about all those close-ups of children in distress yeah. right, that we get on big charity advertisements. I hate the fact that if it shows a situation in this country, there is a disclaimer at the bottom of the screen which says children in this advertisement were played by actors but this reflects a real life situation but we don't have that disclaimer on things filming children in the developing world so presumably we're just filming children there. I've only just started doing this but I've started watching the media to see where images of children are used. Right, on the news last night there was a report from Mosul the first image was a very traumatised looking little child and I thought, when Grenfell Towers happened a few weeks ago, we know there were many children in that tower block, but we did not see any pictures of traumatised children, and rightly so. So how come it's okay to show that little boy in Mosul? Because I don't think it is. Children can be badly exploited. That poster is uh, produced by a child protection charity in the Far East, and I think it's a very powerful poster. Children are not tourist attractions. Um, it's gone onto the back of some of the tuk-tuks in Siem Reap and in Phnom Penh, and I've also seen it in little booklets for tourists in Laos and in Burma, uh, because there's a lot of child trafficking in the Far East, and they're making a real issue out of this. But these so-called tourists are photographing that children. We can't do that here. If we see a really attractive looking child, we can't pull out our phone and photograph them. And their parents would be really furious if we did. We have a, a policy, don't we, that we should ask before taking photos. But we go abroad and we think it's okay to photograph children. The other thing is, if we saw a child selling on the street in school hours, I think we would question why they're not at school. But when we go to developing countries, there are many children selling on the streets, and we stop and we buy from them. And if we query it, and I have queried it with tour guides, if I've been on a tour, and I've said to the guide, could you explain to that child that he should be in school, and if he goes to school, he will be able to earn more money in the future to support his family. And the guides are always very interested and say, tourists don't normally say that. And we often do say to people, please stop buying from the children. And then tourists say, oh, you're a really harsh guide. And then they write really harsh comments on the evaluation forms and the guides don't get work. So I think that we have to take responsibility when we're going and think, is this a good thing to do? When I was um, 
before when I was still at school, when I was uh, um, uh, just on school holidays, right, I went to Peru on holiday to Machu Picchu. This is before I learned any of this kind of uh, stuff that I've learned now. And we came down in a coach and it was a windy road down the mountain, zigzagging down. And on the top corner, there were two very photogenic little boys and they waved at us all as we drove by and we all waved back. And then we went round the road and we got to the next corner and, oh, there's two more little boys, so we waved at them. And then we got to the next corner and we thought, that's the same little boys. Because what they do is run down the mountain and wave on every bend, get to the bottom, jump on the coach and pass the hat round. Mm -hmm. And I gave money, as did everybody else. And I think now, how could I have been so stupid? That was in the middle of the week. They should have been in school. Just about every country around the world signed up to the UN Millennium Goal of free primary education for all by 2015. Every country has schools for children and primary usually means up to 14. We shouldn't be buying from children on a school day that it is a school for them to go to. And of course, don't let's forget that lots of children selling on the street are not taking that money home. Right? They're only there because we're more likely to buy from them. There's somebody actually running them to do that. So this is Victorian child labour. I apologise for all the writing on this slide, but this is an important one. I'm going to go through it bit by bit. One of the biggest uh, areas where people help and support by donating money, by uh, going to visit, by going to volunteer, is orphanages. There is quite a big campaign now to try to get this stopped as far as possible. We haven't had orphanages in this country for a long time. If a children can't stay with their birth family, we have a fostering or an adoption system. Um, and many countries are trying to introduce that, but are being forced to continue with orphanages by people from countries such as ours who are keeping them going with donations and also physically running them. So 80% of children in orphanages around the world are not orphans. They have at least one living parent who would be able to look after them. Volunteer placements in orphanages are now so popular that they're creating a demand for orphans. Mm. Now, they're actually being started because they attract money. The money is being paid by people who are paying to go and volunteer there or donations. Some of the biggest donors to orphanages are really well-meaning people in churches. Most orphanages are found near tourist destinations. Mm -hmm. Now, Pat has personal experience of this, so she's just going to come and tell you about her experience there. Well, when I was in India in 2011, one morning we were told that we were going to visit a small orphanage. Um, the guide made lots of telephone calls on his mobile phone and kept saying, no, not yet, in a little while we'll go. And then after about three quarters of an hour, we all went, and we were taken to what looked like a large uh, car park, deserted car park, with a shed that was locked. They unlocked the shed, and inside in the dark were about 12, 15 little boys sitting cross-legged in the dark. Um, each child had to get up and tell his story about how he'd got there. Uh, it was usually, uh, and it was in the local language, not, not in English, and it was usually that they'd been left on a railway line or their mother had left them or they hadn't had anywhere to go or they were blind and they, they, you know, they had to go into a home. And um, then at the end of this, uh, everybody in the group, about 15 of us, Everybody got out their wallets and gave lots of money to the man who had unlocked the door and shown us in. And, uh, and lots of people, I didn't, but lots of people took photographs of these poor children. And then we were told we could go then. When I got back to the hotel, I checked the itinerary and this wasn't included on the itinerary. So... Yeah. yeah. I mean, we talked about it. Yes. And Pat said to me, "Why do you think this happens on this trip?" And I tried to find out. And you know how, if you go on some holiday trips, you go to a particular shop 
and you know this is the tourist shop and what you buy there um, the guide will get a cut this works in exactly the same way yes the guide and the person managing it will have split the money the donations mm. that were given and you have to hope that those children then went home again mm. and were just brought in for that tour group but um, it, that may not have happened i must say they were very well turned out <laughs> so thank you thank you so some children into orphanages are trafficked but most are given there by their parents uh, because they believe that they will have a better life there but we know don't we that children thrive better in families mm. and become institutionalized if they go into an orphanage there are many orphans in developing countries but they're usually cared for by other members of their family i met someone in kenya he told me i can't understand why there are orphanages here because he came from a different part of kenya and he was working to support his younger brother and sister through school their parents died and they were living with their grandparents while he was working. He had come to work in a hotel near the east coast where many tourists go and he said why are there orphanages here? It's not part of the Kenyan culture. And the answer of course is there are orphanages here because there are hotels here mm. and they're going to attract money for it. There are of course some better run orphanages than others. The worst orphanages I've heard of keep the children hungry and scruffy, a bit like you've described, because that attracts more donations. Uh, but obviously so, there are some people running uh, orphanages where they are caring for children and nobody doubts that sometimes short-term residential care is essential. But they don't want tour groups coming in and they don't want volunteers there. So as far as we're concerned doing those things, I think we need to keep away from them. The best orphanages provide only short-term care and are working on rehoming programmes. I read a book written by an Australian lady who um, went to Cambodia, she's quite a young woman and um, almost fell into the job of running an orphanage, but gradually over the years came to realise that this was not really uh, the best way to look after these children and started to worry in particular about splitting up brothers and sisters because some children might go to the orphanage and some stay at home. She went home uh, to Australia for a trip and when she came back, three new children had come into the orphanage from what she knew was a family of six. So she asked, why have we got these three? And the answer was their dad had brought them and said, I just can't feed all six of my children anymore. He was just a um, subsistence farmer with a reasonably small amount of land. He just couldn't make grow enough to feed his family. They went to visit the family, they found out that of course they didn't want to give half of their children away, they were desperate to be able to do that. What happened in the end was they did not keep those children long term, they bought him a tractor. Mm -hmm. Within six months he'd increased production of his land to the state where he could keep his family. So that family had stayed together. The parents have retained the dignity of being able to provide for their family and incidentally it made financial sense because the cost of the tractor was a lot less than bringing up three children. So there are possible things that can be done to get people back into communities. So if any of you are already supporting orphanages, nobody is suggesting just stop now. But try to find out are they doing these kind of things? because obviously this is a practical way forward. And then children taken from their families easily form attachments. You go into lots of these places and the children come running up to you to be hugged and it's very difficult not to hug them back. Most volunteers have no specialist skills for working with vulnerable children. Most are not police checked. All people and places volunteers have to be police checked, uh, but most organisations wouldn't require that. Uh, and we know that children in institutions are more likely to be abused and those things all kind of hang together. If we've gone in there with the best of intentions and ended up hugging the children what, and then go away again, what we've taught those children is someone may come and love you for a bit but they'll then disappear and also it's okay to hug a stranger. Mm -hmm. huh? But... I am not in any way suggesting, and neither is any of us at people and places, that we should stop supporting children. What we're suggesting is that there are better ways to go about it. 
One of the things that we do is try to find community projects that are helping families become self-sufficient so that they can support their families themselves. These are two community projects in Cambodia. This one is called Trek and is the place where they've got the gardens where the people can come and help. And this one is Grace House and I've been to Grace House before. This is the staff group here and that will include teachers and therapists and social workers and vocational trainers and they are providing them with uh, vocational training, family support, uh, education in the half a day when they're not at school because in Cambodia children go to school for only half the day because there's not enough teachers so teachers do two shifts with two different lots of children um, they're providing aid like rice aid um, helping out in emergencies and they've got a couple of little enterprises going it's a real holistic program with the aim of keeping families together by making them self-sufficient this photograph was taken in Swaziland here this is an area with high incidence of AIDS and they have um, uh, they call them care points, community care points, providing a little bit of preschool education and importantly, two meals a day. And a bit of a break, often for a grandmother who may be bringing up seven or eight grandchildren because all her children have died of age. This is taken at a school in Kenya, that school for the disabled children. As I said to you, uh, in Kenya it's a shame to have a disabled child. Many people disown their children. So this is a residential school, but every child here knows who their family are. Uh, they go home in the holidays. This was prize giving at the end of term. Every child who had a certificate had a member of their family specifically invited to school to go up with them to collect their certificate with them. Even if they'd shown very little interest all year in their child's education, they were made to feel pride in what their child had achieved. So a lot of community education going on there, I think. If we're going into a school, the important thing is to work alongside the teacher, not instead of them. At the very basic level, that ensures that the teacher has not been laid off while the volunteer's there, because that is a possibility when volunteers say the teacher went away and I never saw them again. Why pay a teacher if a volunteer's coming in to do it for free? So we have a very strict policy, no teacher, no volunteer. You leave as well if the local teacher leaves. But also, it clearly works so much better. The teacher knows their children, their abilities. The teacher knows where they're at in the curriculum and what the curriculum is. So there won't be, it won't be any learning the alphabet over and over again. The teacher can translate right, because none of these schools will have English as their first language, although they'll all be learning English. And perhaps most importantly, if the teacher likes some of the ideas that a volunteer shows them for how to teach this bit of the curriculum, they can use that again in the future with other classes, which you can't do if you're just in a room with, with children on your own and no teacher. And then just like the building project, doing what they've asked you to do. They often say, please show us the way you teach in England. They know that there are other ways to teach other than just reading out of the book, but they don't really know what those ideas are. So that we do a lot of this. So this was learning English grammar, the different tenses, by putting cards in the right place on the board. This is a practical science lesson happening outdoors at that school up in the mountains in Nepal. Lots of people ask for computer training, often because they've been donated rather tatty old computers that we don't want anymore. <laughs> but this is a good project because this is a digital learning centre sponsored by companies such as IBM and Microsoft, um, providing them with iPads and latest te technological equipment um, and good training going on there. And in these areas as well, children do need to know how to use computers but in many of these countries, I think they're going to bypass main computers and go straight to the internet on their phone. Um, so we do need to kind of look at how to provide training for that as well. They often say, could you do something to do in music or art or drama? Because in none of the developing countries is that on the curriculum. The curriculum will be um, their local language, English, maths, science and social studies which includes a bit of um, history, geography, maybe a bit of RE. 
Um, I did see PE in a book, but they were only teaching it from the book. They weren't doing any PE. It said things like, to be healthy, you must exercise a lot, but nobody was moving. Lots of people ask for help with small groups. Um, group of school dropouts in St Lucia who were getting some life skills training uh, with volunteer. A one-to-one -one for a girl in a special needs school in St Lucia. A bit of reading practice in South Africa where it is against the law to have anything other than mixed ability classes. So you often have people at either end who need to be withdrawn and that can be a really good and useful thing to do. And then uh, running teachers' workshops, which uh, they quite like, as long as you can fit it in within the school day, not after school, uh, mm -hmm. to do that. And I think that's a good way of getting new ideas across, as long as we think of it as we might if we go on an uh, inset day in this country. So when I went on an inset day, when I was teaching, I don't think I ever came home and thought everything I did on that day was absolutely fantastic and I will use all of it. But hopefully I didn't come back and say that whole day was a waste of time. Hopefully I came back with one or two ideas that I might try out with this class or that class. And if we regard it like that, uh, that we're maybe giving them a lot of ideas and then maybe just one or two ideas that they take on, then I think we've done a good job. And so finally, my final thoughts, considering all the problems that I've just outlined to you, should we continue to support people in developing countries? Well, obviously that's people's individual choice, but for me, how can we not? We have so much financially, skills based because of the training we've received, because of the environment that we live in. How can we not want to share that a bit uh, to help people to uh, get their standard of living up to something just a little bit closer to ours. Right. But how can we judge which projects are ethical and responsible and which do more harm than good? I've suggested you ask questions, but everybody is going to tell you that their project is a good one. Everybody is going to say, well, there may be some bad practice happening out there, but it's not this one. So how on earth can we begin to find that out? Especially if we're not going volunteering for a month when we might be expected to do a bit of research, if we're just wanting to make a donation or deciding whether to help at a coffee morning or a car boot sale to help, help someone raise some money for their gap year trips. How can we know? Well, one tip that I use a lot, which is a bit of a crude measure, but is quite quick to do, is this whole point about thinking about people as our equals, treating people with respect. Just one or two ideas on how that might work. I try to mentally swap places with people. Would what I'm proposing to do be okay if someone was doing it to me or some members of my family in my country? So should I go in to an area where I have no skills to help out. I wouldn't want someone to do that to me, they would be in my way, so I shouldn't do it. Should I go on a visit to a school? Well, we wouldn't have people going into our schools or preschools when we didn't know who they were, so why should we expect to do that when we're abroad? I met somebody in Nepal, the lady who was doing the restaurants, who had wanted to come and do some volunteering as a waitress in a cafe in London. She couldn't do that because our country didn't give her a visa. The reason we didn't give her a visa, one of the reasons why we didn't give her a visa, was because although she was going to be unpaid, she would actually be filling a vacancy that could be filled by somebody living in London. If it's not okay for her to come here to our country, why is it okay for us to go and do that there? Working alongside people, yeah to work with them to improve their capacity, that's a different thing, but taking a potential job, no. What about photographs? Is it okay for us to go into places and just photograph whatever we like? When I was in Burma, on the lake area there, the area where they grow all the tomatoes, people in the villages around don't have running water in their homes. There's not a shortage of water, they draw water from wells, so that's a bit of a hassle. So at the beginning and the end of the day, you see lots of people down by the lakeside, 
maybe up to waist in water, shampoo in their hair, washing um, with the soap. And all the tourist boats have to go past this to get back to the tourist hotels. And people take photographs. And I thought, well, in the past I might have done that. It's culturally quite interesting. It's a different way of life. But if I do my mental swap places, and I think of a group of foreigners with their long zoom lenses on their cameras and they're in my bathroom when I'm having a shower, it really does start to feel very different. And if we think, go back to the orphanages, if we think of a Christian run orphanage in Nepal and I met somebody in the place where I was staying who was running five of these, thinking they're doing a fantastic job by bringing children from mountain villages where they have very little, where there was a lot of destruction during the earthquake and providing them with an excellent environment with a school attached, lots of regular outings and treats and certainly well fed, uh, well clothed, not an orphanage where they're treating them badly, we might think, yep, that's a project we ought to support. But I was thinking, if we imagine people coming from a wealthy Muslim country, maybe Pakistan or one of the Arab states, and setting up a state-of-the-art residential centre with all the latest high-tech equipment for white British children in a deprived area of one of our inner cities, I think we'd call that indoctrination. Mm -hmm. So swapping places, I think, works very well and treating people with respect has to be the key point and I would like to give the final word to a young man called Stephen who was brought up in an orphanage in Kenya. Um, the way he finishes, well he's writing about children so he's just talking about children but if we widen that to include people generally what he says about respect and treating people as equals is what I would want to say. I'd like to read you this because I think it's a powerful bit of writing. The volunteers arrive, dressed in a uniform of blue shorts and yellow and blue t-shirts branded with the name of the orphanage, we were gathered under a tree for shade, standing at the centre of the institution to wait for the visitors. The only thing we never had were shoes. My feet had gotten used to the rough pebbles underneath and had hardened, hardened enough to crush twigs and sometimes even thorns bent when they came into contact. Often the reason behind not wearing shoes was to show how impoverished we were to persuade donors to donate more. The institution staff had taught us a routine. They paraded us and as soon as the visitors arrived in tour vans we had to exude joy. Indeed we jumped up and down and raptured in unison with song and dance that welcomed them. We knew the only way to ensure they came back again to help the institution was by how much they smiled at our entertainment and by the tears, sadness or sympathy that came when they were told we were orphans. I remember the senior staff on duty standing at the centre of a circle of volunteers pronouncing how some of us had been abandoned by our parents, how others had been picked up from the streets and others rejected by families. The majority of, the majority of us often dropped our heads in shame and embarrassment during these introductions. The term orphan, although sometimes used with good intentions, had become a homogenising and pathologising label. It stole away our individuality and dignity. Silently, I felt sad and miserable to have people gawk at me and have cameras flashing at our faces. Most of the volunteers were taken round the institution to see where we slept, where our food was cooked and told of upcoming projects. Some committed to help and others gave a one-off donation. Some of these encounters were brief. They pulled down their sunglasses, walked back to their vans, and from the vehicles they waved us goodbye. At this point, some of us had got used to their coming and going, but others not, especially the younger ones. Tears knocked at their eyelids. They tried not to cry in an environment where crying was almost taboo. This practice with visitors had become a routine that made many of us feel even more alienated, isolated, stigmatised, helpless, hopeless and weak. There were some volunteers who came and stayed longer. Every morning they showed up to play with some children. We acknowledged their presence. Many of us felt they were closer to us as adults than the absent staff. They were a reflection and model that adults too could interact with us children. We did indeed cling to their presence like they were never going to leave. But again, they had to leave. All we could do is curl and behave like nothing ever happened. But deep inside they had shattered our trust. 
Many had their favourite children, especially the younger ones who got momentary hugs and kisses and were called sweet and adorable. On the other hand, those not adorable were left alone. Additionally, it was sad because this fermented envy and resentment among older children and many living with disability who were just to be seen from a distance and unappreciated. There were instances where volunteers became attached to some specific children and they offered to sponsor their education and meet other needs. Again, this reinforced the feelings of envy. Some children had parents and relatives, but as the volunteers had been told they were orphans, the children were denied an opportunity to visit their parents to maintain this lie. If they visited or were taken home, then they were not orphans. The institution, fearing they would lose funding and support, couldn't let this happen. So long as volunteers and visitors are funding or bringing donations, doors are always wide open in institutions and there are few adequate child protection measures and systems in place. Funding and supporting institutions disrupts the local family and community-based child protection systems. We deny local families and communities a sense of responsibility and accountability. This has often led to even the local community referring to these children as the children of the institution. These community systems, although incapacitated at times to provide materially, remain a fundamental pillar in ensuring that children have a sense of belonging, identity, and that they receive the love they need for growth and development. Our efforts should be to strengthen this more sustainable system. Our efforts should be to keep families together and strengthen a sense of community. We need to be cautious and conscious that our actions or funding do not deprive children of their sense of dignity. A child in Africa or a child in any developing country deserves the same rights, dignity and respect as any child elsewhere. There are no second-hand children. Thank you for listening. Thank you.